So one question we're going to answer today is, is this a safe way to charge your EV? Hi everyone, this is Andrew Tyne. Welcome to my YouTube channel. One of the most common questions that people ask me about EV ownership is, how do I actually charge my car? So if you're lucky enough to have a driveway, then you can install a wall box like this one and then charge your car directly. However, if you live in a purpose-built block of flats or a house conversion or just a normal terraced house without access to off-street parking, then you're going to be expected to be using the public charging network. There are now literally thousands of EV charge points all over the country. However, can we actually rely on these charge points always being available when we need them? So if you look at this BP Pulse charge point here, it's actually out of service. This commenter here is saying that it's been broken for almost a year now. I went to go and have a look at it and it looks like this charge point has seen better days. Sometimes chargers are actually broken, but they're not delivering the full charge rate. Sometimes the issues are as trivial as the payment or the card method is not being taken. The other phenomenon we have to take into account is also the concept of being iced. What iced means is that an internal combustion engine car has parked in an EV charging spot. So you can see on this lamppost charger, there's a little sign which asks very nicely for people in petrol or diesel cars to not park there unless they are on EV. However, this is just a suggestion and there are no actual consequences for parking your petrol or diesel car in an EV charging spot. So sometimes you'll actually find signs that seem to enforce that EVs only are able to park in this particular charging spot. However, these seem to be the exception rather than the rule and they don't seem to be in particularly high traffic areas. And for example here, I've got a EV charging spot which is next to a hospital and this particular spot is prone to being iced quite frequently. And it's not just petrol and diesel carts, it's also other electrical vehicles too. So for example, I was once at this charging area in the car park and what I saw was a quite a large queue of people. So there was a, like a Tesla, a Leaf and some other EVs all waiting in line for this particular charge point to become available. And so you don't really know when you get to an actual charge point whether you're actually going to be able to charge. And especially because charging requires at least, you know, 30 minutes to 40 minutes to, to be actually worthwhile, then you'll actually experience quite substantial queuing. Whereas at a petrol station, you'll be in and out within, you know, five, 10 minutes. There's definitely some uncertainty about whether you'll actually be able to charge properly. So for a lot of people, the only option is to actually use street parking and then to actually drape an extension cable over the pavement. And you can see that this really does cause issues with safety. So for example, you can see that there's an extension cable here, there's a box here, and then there's another extension here, and then the three pin charger is being draped all the way over there. So this is definitely a kind of trip and danger to anyone using it. If a wheelchair user came here, or a child tripped over it, or wrapped themselves around the cable, this is definitely a danger. Is this actually illegal to do? What I found is that different councils in the UK deal with electric charging over the pavement in different ways. So this particular article from Wandsworth Times, this is not really about pavement charging. This is simply a debate about whether the actual charger should be in the middle of the pavement like it is here or actually on the road itself so that it doesn't disrupt people who are walking. You can see that Wandsworth would probably have a stronger reaction to somebody draping it over the pavement for it's like 12 hours a day or something like that. If we look at this guidance from Hampshire County Council, they actually have an actual guidance for how to actually lay your cable over the pavement. So they're saying that here, this is a kind of dangerous way of placing the cable because you know this is a, definitely a trip hazard and that's definitely a trip hazard as well. So this is quite interesting because they're actually providing proper guidance about how to apply this cable over the road. You need a cable protector, which has high visibility and that it should fully extend the width of any footway between the property and the vehicle. So if we took the Hampshire County Council's rules and applied them to the real world like I've done here, you can definitely see that this protector is not really long enough to cover the full width of the pedestrian walkway. And this particular example that I found in central London is quite a funny and inventive one, to be honest. But some people might look at it and say, well, there's nothing wrong with it. That looks quite secure to me. But if somebody tripped over that side and then pulled the cable down, that cable might go over someone's head that might trip somebody up quite easily. So the point is that electric over the pavement charging is often the only guaranteed way for many people to actually be able to charge their car, especially if they live in a terrace or a flat. Before we demonize this too much, let's remember that many people actually do drape their electric cables over the pavement and they're not even charging their car. So for example, this workman is using this particular electric cable and all he's doing is using some equipment to do some work on a car. And we don't really think too much about this. The main point is that we should be as safe as possible. We should consult our local council's guidance on this. And that if we do lay cable over the pavement, we should do it in as safe a way as possible. That does not obstruct pedestrians and is not a danger to other people. So 
I live in a terrace property kind of in zone 2 North London and I don't have actually have access to my own charger. However, I'm going to show you how exactly I charge and how I've managed to get away with driving over 1,500 miles so far without actually owning a home charger or using any of the public charging network. So although I'm in a terrace property, I'm fortunate enough to sometimes be able to park my car in front of my property and I'm able to pull a cable over the pavement. So I think that this cable cover protector is probably the most important aspect of your pavement charging method. So this one is soft and flexible and it's two meters long, which means that it's wide enough for most pavements. And it means that we can insert the charging extension lead into the actual inside. So this one I had to actually cut myself. What I'm going to do is leave a link to this in the description. So previously I used a 10 meter coiled extension lead like this one here. So some of the commenters of my last video told me that I should probably replace my extension lead because it's a bit of a danger, especially if it gets dewy like this or it rained on it. And it's also something that generates heat. If it's coiled up and you don't uncoil it, then it can cause heating issues. So the extension cable that I replaced it with is called the Master Plug Weatherproof Outdoor Cable. And it's a 15 meter orange cable. And the main kind of feature that we have is this IP54 rated seal. So as you can see, I've got my MG5 charger plugged into this and you're supposed to be able to fit this cap over it. However, I did find that my actual granny charge cable is a little bit thick. And so I couldn't actually get the plug to fully seal. So what I did was I used the pair of scissors to slightly modify the the seal so that the cable can actually fit and the seal can actually lock down. So obviously this would affect the IP54 rating, but as long as you're sensible about it and make sure that you don't leave it in a place where it could fall into a puddle, then this connection is safe enough, I would say. So the last piece of the puzzle is something that somebody recommended to me from the MG EV forum. And what they said is that I should use an RCD. This is called a residual current device. I'm going to leave this link to this and all of the products here in the description. And so what this does is that it prevents kind of electric shocks from happening. For example, if something happened to this wire, this would cut the power and hopefully prevent any kind of electric shocks. So this plugs into the extension lead when I plug it into one of the three pin sockets at home. So this is definitely going to be useful. So a combination of these three items together, I'm able to safely drape the cable over the pavement and not have to worry about pedestrians tripping over or anyone getting tangled up or the rain getting into the actual cable itself. So I definitely say that your ability to rely solely on charging using the three pin charger really depends on your particular EV that you're using and then also the habits that you have. So my MG5, which is the car that I'm driving, which I'm very, very happy with, has a WLTP range of 214 miles. So in my typical city usage, I barely go through 5% of that, 10% of that per day on average. So I can get away with waiting for a space to open up in front of my property before needing to charge. And so far, 1,500 miles, I've not actually needed to go to a public charger yet. I've been able to rely on this charging cable solely so far. And you know, I don't really do very long journeys, so obviously my case is not going to be the same as yours. But for example, in this Airbnb property, I've actually used this full 15 meters to charge my car in the parking spot of that property, just by running the cable through the window. And then also I have my in-laws house too, which I visit sometimes. And I use the external power plug there to run the cable to my car, just park into the driveway. The way reality is that you don't necessarily need a fast charger. As long as you can charge overnight, you'll basically have a fully charged car by the next morning. So this is how I keep my bundle of cables all coiled up and together and in a compact space saving manner. And this all fits in my car and it has a kind of permanent space there. And I also keep my type two charger just in case I need to access a public charger, which isn't tethered. So that should be everything that you need to charge your car. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you do have any suggestions about how I can improve my EV charging setup, then please do let me know. I'm always open to suggestions, especially because this is the first EV I've ever owned. And uh, if you have any suggestions for topics that I could cover next or want to know more about driving the MG5, please do leave a comment as well. If you did like the video, please give it a like, please subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.